So uh, welcome everybody. I am Bobby Duffy. I'm director of the Policy Institute at King's and I'll be chairing this event today which is being hosted by the Policy Institute and Aging Research at King's which is a cross-college initiative to bring together researchers on aging from all sorts of discipline. Um, the event today is based around this uh, excellent uh, book, uh, The Age of Aging Better with a question mark, a very important question mark there at the end uh, by Anna Dixon, who is of course, Chief Executive of the Center for Aging Better. Uh, the book was uh, just recently published and it's an excellent outline of the challenges we face now and over the next few decades, but it's also a positive vision for what we can do. Um, its subtitle is a manifesto for our future, which gives you an idea of its focus and its uh, vision. So Anna will take us through some of the key themes from the book first, then we're delighted to have a response from Lord David Willits, who is president of the Resolution Foundation's Advisory Council and Intergenerational Centre, and of course visiting professor at Policy Institute at King's and author of The Pinch. Um, we actually held an event back in January when we could hold events uh, together on the publication of an updated version of The Pinch, um, which is a great event where Anna gave an excellent response. Um, so it seemed like a great idea to just do it the other way around. So David will take about 10 minutes, give his response. And then after that, we've got plenty of time for questions uh, from you. Um, please put those in the Q&A function on Zoom uh, and I'll pick them up from there, the chat is open for comments and discussions among people. I'm going to struggle just to, just with coping with the Q&A, so I won't be looking at the comments uh, that closely. So just put them in the Q&A and do start putting questions in uh, pretty early on. Uh, early questions are more likely to get asked and I suspect looking at the great audience list we've got for this event that we're going to get a lot of great um, questions. If you're tweeting during the event, uh, please use the hashtag age of aging uh, better. Um, uh, and that's it in terms of intro. Just before I hand over to Anna, we just wanted to test this great audience's, expert audience's own optimism and uh, pessimism for the next decade. So we've got a question, polling question uh, for you, uh, if our colleague can make that uh, live. So do you, our great audience, uh, think that the next decade will be an age of aging better with just two responses? Uh, yes or no. Enormously complex debate boiled down to this two, two possible responses. Of course, we'll go into the intricacies in the discussion. Uh, it's, uh, this is just to get a general sense of our collective optimism or pessimism. So keep voting. Uh, that's probably long enough. Um, Rebecca, if we can see the results. Here we are. Oh, so we've got 63% saying yes, it will be an age of aging better, 37% uh, saying no, so fairly split, but uh, on the optimistic side, which is a great segue into your section on your uh, book, Anna. So over to you, very welcome. Thanks very much, uh, Bobby, and thanks everyone for joining today. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about my new book, um, <clears throat> The Age of Aging Better. Um, I think I've just about got used to these uh, online meetings, but uh, it's still a bit weird, isn't it? I'm never quite sure where to look. Do you look directly at the camera? Do you look at the person you're uh, speaking to? Or, God forbid, to look at yourself? Um, these decisions that we make uh, in this virtual world are actually very similar to the decisions that we're making all the time in real life. We decide where to look. We choose what gets our attention and where to focus our gaze. Um, well, I've spent uh, much of the last 20 years looking at issues around the aging population from one angle or another in various jobs. And I'd argue that it's probably one of the toughest and most complex issues out there. There's a whole heap of ethical, financial, social, political, economic, and environmental implications too. And yet people just don't want to talk about it. We're all guilty of failing to face up to and grasp what this age shift means for our society, for our communities, and of course, for us and our families. I believe we must have the courage to face up to this, particularly now in the face of the coronavirus pandemic. 
we must look ourselves collectively in the eye and ask ourselves what future do we want? An age of aging better or an age of aging badly? Any day of the week, I would argue, you know, open the newspaper, you're almost bound to find some negative headline or article referring to a tsunami of older people or the pension time bomb or the fact that the NHS is going to be overwhelmed by the burden of older people. Combine these with narratives that suggest it's older people who caused Brexit or the baby boomers who bankrupted the country and you're left with a pretty pernicious view of this age shift. Now in David's book, which I'm sure he'll talk about later, uh, it's a really interesting analysis of how different generations are fed and he argues that baby boomers have stolen their children's future by voting for policies which preserve their own wealth at the expense of those younger than them. I'm sure David will make uh, it clear that it's more complex than that, but um, I look forward to having a chance to discuss it at the end. I worry about the impact of this narrative. Um, I suppose at one end, at its mildest, it manifests in younger people viewing older people as something of a nuisance. Uh, people be familiar with the OK Boomer meme, a bit of harmless fun. But at the harsher end, these stereotypes can lead and have led newspaper columnists to write serious articles arguing that a cull of older people could be a good thing. And these stereotypes, they stop us seeing clearly what's actually going on. So when we look at all of those in their 50s, 60s or 70s and see wealthy boomers, the 1.6 million pensioners in absolute poverty in the UK become invisible. We don't see the 2 million over 55s who are living in houses that put their health and well-being at risk, or the hundreds of thousands of over 50s who are stuck in an unemployment trap. Perhaps it's uh, convenient for us as a society to look away from these people. Um, it's uncomfortable to see, but also perhaps because we're scared, we're scared of becoming those people ourselves. But we do need to stop averting our eyes. We need to take a proper look at the future. And so I just want to take you through some of the data and themes from my book. So we are living uh, longer than ever before. Uh, in fact, we are living a lot longer. The change in life expectancy is really quite staggering over uh, the last century. As you can see here, I hope, um, if that's uh, sharing okay, uh, that a baby bo boy born in 1916 in England could have expected to live to about 58. A baby boy born in 2016 can expect to see his 90th birthday. And at the same time as we're living longer, we're seeing a larger cohort of baby boomers approaching later life. So we often when we talk about baby boomers, we lump together everyone born between 1945 and 1965, but I'm particularly interested and really focus in my book on those born in the 1960s. There was a significant baby boom. So between 1960 and 1969, there were over 8.3 million births in the UK. I want to show this age shift in action. You can see here, 20 years ago, there were 9.3 million people over 65 when those 1960 baby boomers were in their 30s. Today, there are over 12 million people over 65. And if we fast forward 20 years into the future, we can expect to see a staggering 17 million people over 65. Those 1960s baby boomers who are now in their 50s will enter what we might call later life in the decades to come. So that actually means the age shift in the UK is only just getting started. We ain't seen nothing yet. This is a big shift and for many it's a scary one. There are plenty of pessimists and doomongers who say this cohort is going to bankrupt the treasury, that somehow society won't be able to cope. But the fact is that we're pretty adaptable as humans. We've seen in response to COVID that in fact the world en masse seems to have undertaken probably one of the biggest, fastest where social, legal and political transformations in history. We need to take a similarly radical approach to the age shift if we're going to 
realize the huge opportunities of these longer lives. And there are four areas where I, I'll pick from the book, there are more, uh, where we should, uh, I think, be positive about what we can do and what we can do better. And I'd like to just briefly go through each of those uh, with you uh, today. Firstly, creating better communities. So one of the positive things, and there are a few, uh, but one of the positive things about the COVID crisis is the way we've seen people in communities coming together to support one another. So I'm in an area which has always had a great uh, community spirit, uh, much of it centered around the church, the local shops. There's a memory cafe for people with dementia and their carers, a night shelter for uh, the homeless. Well, all of this shut up uh, shop as soon as the lockdown was announced. But it was great to see how the community spirit endured. People voluntarily coming forward to offer help, contacting those uh, in need, a huge number of people volunteering to deliver food and medicines, or simply calling to chat to someone who was on their own or self-isolating. But at the same time, as many have been volunteering for the first time, or giving more time than usual. Many older volunteers have been forced to withdraw, and this is a huge loss. So before the pandemic, over a quarter of those aged 65 to 74 formally volunteered at least once a month. It's a higher proportion, as you can see, than any other age group. So as we rebuild our communities, finding ways to bring these volunteers back safely and inclusively will be vital as well as harnessing the enthusiasm of the hundreds of thousands of new volunteers. And why was harnessing this spirit so important right now? Well, we've seen our communities suffer in recent years. Uh, many of the spaces that allow people of different ages and, uh, to come together, libraries, community centres, have been closing down. And high streets have really struggled to survive as much shopping moves online. After the lockdown, it's very unlikely that we're going to see those town centres recover. So we're going to need to reimagine and imagine radical ways to revitalise these spaces. So how about converting empty retail space into accessible housing developments or installing more happy to chat benches to encourage people to stop and talk to one another or keeping streets car free and greening them to create outdoor space to exercise and meet with others. Whatever the future of our communities, I would argue that local people of all ages must be at the heart of rebuilding them. The second area I'd like to touch on is about building better housing. Lockdown, obviously, men lost us, we're spending a lot more time in our homes and I think we've seen them with fresh eyes, haven't we? Uh, we can see the importance of light, of good digital connectivity, uh, perhaps an outdoor space or balcony. Uh, efficient heating, although to be honest, because of the heat wave, I think uh, cooling has been more the issue. And as a result, lockdown has shone a light on the terrible impact of poor quality housing and just of how much of our housing in this country is non-decent, with overcrowding, lack of light and lack of access to outdoor space. So it's absolutely critical, and I put it forward as one of the key changes in the book, that we need to build better homes for the future, homes that allow us to live a full and fulfilling life when we are older. And this should be for everyone. When my mother-in-law became ill, uh, we were able to adapt her home. Uh, it made a huge difference to her quality of life in later life. We put in a downstairs loo, walk-in shower, and it was great. Uh, the joy she felt when she was able to have a shower and have her hair washed, even when she was very ill. But we were able to make those changes because we had the money. Not everyone is so fortunate. So today, there are over 4 million homes in this country that according to government standards are deemed to be a risk to health and wellbeing. And half of those are lived in by someone over 55. This is appalling, obviously, in terms of the costs, human costs, but it also brings a hefty price tag for the NHS. And more than 90% of homes don't meet even the most basic accessibility standards. That means that they are visitable to someone with a disability. And this results in more people needing social care. So there's a really strong argument for the government to invest 
in a significant upgrade of our existing homes, perhaps through a retrofit and refurbishment programme, particularly targeted on older low income homeowners, but also to increase the basic accessibility standards to a higher level to which all new homes should be built. We must take action now to build better housing. We have an opportunity both to transform people's lives, but also to reduce demand on NHS and social care system for decades to come. The third issue I wish to touch on is about creating better workplaces. So the COVID crisis has given us a glimpse uh, of what is possible in terms of flexible working. We've had the technology and capacity to allow home working for a while now, but it took a crisis to start using that technology to its full potential. And as more of us have caring responsibilities, enabling this kind of flexible working is becoming more and more important. So employers and policymakers take note. This shift to inclusive ways of working needs to be permanent. Along with uh, health, caring is one of the leading causes for why people over 50 drop out of the workforce before state pension age. The drop off begins in people's mid 50s and by the year before state pension age, less than half of people are in work. So employers need to do much more to support workers with health conditions and disability to gain and regain and remain in work. The government also needs to look at introducing rights, for example, to carers leave, similar to parental leave. But there is another big concern. We can't not talk about the impact of a recession which uh, on older workers. So we know from past recessions that job losses and redundancies have a long lasting and disproportionate effect on people over 50 because the evidence shows that once they've left the workplace, they rarely return. Obviously the crisis is going to require a massive effort from government to get people back into work. And my message is that we can't afford to let those who are approaching later life uh, slip through the net. There needs to be support for people of all ages to get back to work and to help them retrain. So a real need for us to have better work that's more secure, better paid and more fulfilling. But there's also a huge amount to be done to make sure that for those who can't work, that the welfare system really works for people. At the moment, it currently fails to recognise that our age has very little to do with our ability to work. It's very much more determined by our health and disability. And as I'll come on to show in the final section on health, there are huge inequalities. So as state pension age has risen for women in recent years, we've not only seen an increase in the number of women working at older ages, which is a good thing, but an increase in the number of women on employment support allowance. That's a benefit for people unable to work due to health or disability. The impact of coronavirus on economies around the world has raised questions about employment and welfare entitlements. And interestingly, I think Spain has recently taken the first steps towards considering introducing a form of universal basic income. I think it's these kind of radical ideas that need to be on the table as we shape a welfare system for our longer lives. So the final area which um, I explore in the book is the need for us to be in better health. If there's one thing this pandemic has done, it's certainly lifted the curtain on uh, an issue that I think we really have kept out of sight and out of mind for too long. It's the state of our health and this truly staggering impact that person's background and wealth has on their health and their risk from diseases, including communicable diseases like COVID-19, where we've seen that those from the poorest backgrounds have died at twice the rate of the wealthiest. So while many of us uh, can expect to live longer than our parents or grandparents, Men in the poorest areas can expect to live an additional 18 years in poor health compared to men in the richest areas. And here you can see the gap for women, uh, showing the difference between those in the poorest areas and the healthy life expectancy uh, in the richest 10% of areas. What does this actually mean in human terms? It means poorer people in their early 50s experiencing ill health and disability such that for many it makes working difficult and indeed for some 
impacts on their activities of daily living. So without urgent action for better health, we do risk that a long and healthy life will become the preserve of the wealthy. So what needs to be done? We know that alcohol, smoking and obesity are some of the biggest risk factors for ill health, but so far I'd say that action to tackle them from the government simply hasn't gone far enough. But also critical to our health is physical activity. And unfortunately the pandemic has again uh, revealed growing inequalities. Some people more active, others less active. We need to not leave this to individual motivation, but encourage it through active travel and support to get those who are inactive uh, moving again. If we don't act to improve the health of the population and reduce health inequalities, more and more of our extra years will be spent in poor health. And that means a greater burden on the NHS, obviously, but also a loss to the economy from worklessness. They say that you should never waste a crisis, and I hope we don't waste this current one uh, for too long. I would argue we've failed to face up to the age shift that I've described. In my book, I set out a manifesto, a clear picture of the better world we can create. But if we have the courage to act, a world where people are in good health for longer, they are able to contribute to their communities, to stay in fulfilling work, where our homes meet our needs and our neighbourhoods enable us to keep connected. So I look forward to the discussion. I hope you enjoy reading the book, but I guess more than that, I hope you have the courage to act, to do what you can to make the age of aging better a reality for us all. Thank you very much. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Anna. I, uh, now we're just gonna go straight over to David and I've got your slides actually, David, I think. So I think I can share them for you if you would like. Uh, Fantastic. There you go. Good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bobby, and uh, thank you also, Anna, and I greatly enjoyed reading Anna's book, which is a very useful guide to the issues affecting the growing size of the older population. Um, and my answer to the original question, do, do, whether we thought the next decade would be an, a, a decade of ageing better, uh, my answer was yes. Uh, it was yes, partly because I hope that uh, some of the ideas in Anna's book are implemented. But the other reason why I said yes gets to the heart of my argument in my book, The Pinch, about the power of the baby boomers. And my argument in a nutshell was that this big cohort born after the war between the Twin Peaks of the immediate birth rate in about uh, immediately after which you can see here, and then the second peak in the mid 60s, which Anna talks about, that big generation, as they've gone through our society, like a python swallowing a pig, have shaped society in their image. It's not because they're bad or even, or really particularly good. I'm a boomer myself, so I should really say we. It's not that we are selfish or we are particularly altruistic. It's just that there are a lot of us. And as a result of being a lot of us, we have shaped society in our image, both when we were young uh, and now as we grow old. And the fact that we now have this very lively debate about aging is the latest bit of evidence of how what a significant cohort we are. We're, as we grow older, and as this big cohort grows older, so in two society, senses society ages, so our preoccupations as a large aging group become central to the policy debate. So the very fact we're having this discussion, I regard as an example of the very phenomenon that I'm talking about. And we will absolutely shape public policy in our image. We will be looked after. The question is uh, whether this will come at the expense of others and how we do it. And my fear is that this does come at the expense of others. And we are in general, on average, an unusually affluent generation who, as we have so far grown older, have seen our living standards rise in contrast to other age groups. And if, Bobby, you move to the next slide, you see as an ex you see a very vivid uh, example of this. And I think, Bob, uh, 
Oh, David, I think you've frozen for us. <laughs> frozen midpoint. We'll give him a second. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> Let's stop that uh, sharing. Let's see when David comes back. Um, so in the meantime, uh, we've had uh, some brilliant questions uh, for Anna. Um, let's see if we can take, so you're right to take some of those, Anna. Yeah, very happy David, to, to, David, to some, some questions. Yeah. Reconnect. Uh, so we've had loads of questions come in already. Um, and one of the things, having read the book, um, uh, and uh, know you covered this. Uh, oh, here's David. Hi. Oh, I, David. First, I do apologize. I've been suffering a bad broadband collection um, all no, afternoon. Right. I do apologize. I don't know how much was lost. Had you moved on to the consumption slide, the second slide? No, we weren't. We weren't there. We can get okay. that. Can Here we are. Move on to the, the, here we are. That's employment. This, this is an example of one before that. Uh, we got that one. Consumption, yeah. There we are. Yeah. So this is, there's a perception that older people are poor and poor people are old. And an awful lot of public policy still works on that basis. It's really important for future public policy that we don't assume that any longer. And, the, and we have both in my book, The Pinch, and in the report of the Intergenerational Commission from Resolution Foundation, we've got a lot of evidence of what you could regard as social progress, that being old is no more, uh, being old is no, makes you no more likely of being to be more than other age group. And the kind of trends we're talking about are captured in this slide, which just shows how much people consume, apart from household costs, how much they consume per person dependent on their ages. And if you look at the line at the bottom, which is people aged over 65, you will see that the consumption of people aged over 65 per week now exceeds, for the first time in recorded history, the consumption of people aged 8 to 29. So we have a, we're talking about an age group who are no longer, on average, poor. And the average, by the way, is not a misleading average. Some people say, oh, you're just talking averages because it must be a small group of very rich old distorting it. Not at all. This is true of median pensioners being more affluent than the median working age household. It's true of the poorest 20% of pensioners being more affluent, the poorest 20% of working age households, and the, the richest, the, the top end of pensioners being more affluent than the top 20th percentile of working age households. So this is a wider phenomenon. Now, in many, it's a good thing that older people have had this progress, but it does mean every time we work design policy on the grounds, if people above a certain age, we're very likely also to pick and help poor people that is longer a reliable guide to public. Now, what do we do? When it comes in practice to the latest, what's happening in the uh, coronavirus crisis, and Bobby, if you could do quickly the next slide, we see the same, we see people most affected by the crisis. To some extent, over 60s, all want in the jobs market. This is, I'm not trying to hide the evidence. If anything, it's a bit of a U-shaped curve. Um, and it's true, older people are aged over 60 are also suffering a bit. They don't have any scarring long-term effects as young people might have. And Bobby, if you move on to the next slide, you'll see uh, even later evidence of the same phenomenon. Who are people who are in the job retention scheme? Ver the vulnerable people in the workforce are very likely to be young. Uh, and with some increase if you're over 60. So, Yet again, we're going through another economic crisis where it is the younger people who are most vulnerable. Now, what do we do about it? Um, and a lot of Anna's practical proposals make sense, provided that the bill is not picked up by the younger generation. And let's take one example of the share. Of course, it's right that we need to do something about the social care crisis. It's another problem revealed uh, by the virus in the past few months but if there uh, if there are measures to extend access and extend funding of social care it is very important the costs are not borne by the younger working age population when there may well be amongst the older population 
people who to contribute to meeting their own social care costs, provided, of course, that there is a cap on the, on the costs that they have to pay, one of the catastrophic omissions in the, in the Tory manifesto proposal of 2017. So I just want our policy discussion to be resting on solid foundations of the empirical evidence, what is actually happening to the incomes and assets of different age groups. One final point. Uh, what I think I completely agree with Anna and is admirable is that I do wish to see different age groups helping each other. And I think that it, old people care about their children and grandchildren. Children care about their parents and grandparents. It's not that we lack intergenerational caring and compassion. What we lack sometimes, rigorous evidence on the people who are most in need and how we should be helping them. And the evidence is, thank heavens, in general, the baby boom generation, as they grow older, will be more affluent than any previous older generation in British history. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, David. That was excellent. Well, coped with the slight dropout. Um, always frustrating when you get those things on these types of events for people. So thank you for coping with that so smoothly uh, and coming back in. Um, so Anna, actually, do you want to respond in any way before we go on to our questions from the audience, which we have? You, you've got time still as an audience to uh, submit some more questions. We have got some great ones that we will uh, go through. Yeah, so I suppose just picking up on David's point, uh, you know, showing increased consumption amongst, um, on average, amongst the older generation. I think, you know, and, and David knows that this is probably my retort, um, is the inequalities within generations. And so whilst I think you're absolutely right that we should no longer equate uh, older age with poverty, which was true, um, you know, 20 or more years ago, um, that you know that there are now people who are wealthy in later life but there are also people and you know i i, I talked about the nearly two two million people who are experiencing uh, poverty in in later life and we also know that there is a cohort coming behind so in that sort of my definition of baby boomer the 60s baby boomers who are in their 50s and 60s um are actually gonna i think really suffer um because they haven't got the defined benefits. They may have had some early contributing years, but latterly not. They've, you know, they've got very partial defined benefit pensions. They are going to have to work longer because the state pension age is rising. They may have, um, you know, still got significant mortgages, but a higher proportion are, are going to be private renters than we've seen in the past. And, you know, I just think the long-term effects of, um, these workers being furloughed and then potentially losing their jobs and exiting uh, the labour market is really severe because what we are seeing as data is coming in is that these people are either not eligible for universal credit because they have pension savings and they are expected if you're 55 basically to start drawing down those those any savings you have that are private so so these people are going to reach state pension age pretty destitute already and you know potentially with quite a long life to still sustain uh, beyond that uh, and it has also obviously then detrimental effects on health too so so i suppose it's just really emphasizing the inequalities and that there will be some long-term effects I, I i know that they're not as long term as the effect on a on a 20 year old but for someone in their 50s today who loses their job and doesn't return, there are long-term effects that we as a society need to be recognising and long-term costs for the state. Mm. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. So on questions, uh, they're coming in thick and fast, uh, faster than I can cope with, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so I think there is one, just going back to the book and the focus of the book. Um, so it was written pre covid 19 um, and it's just thinking there's a couple there's a theme within the questions about um, uh, uh, how do we apply it in this new reality so uh, could you tell us what could you tell the audience what you would have updated or what you'd suggest and there's a couple of um, specifics in that including what's the most important thing we can plan to do for older residents in our local communities in the new normal how do we adapt well uh, you know I think if anything it, it just highlights some of the 
urgency for action even greater than when I wrote the book. So, you know, the lack of a decent social care system that's properly funded, the terrible sort of conditions we expect people to be living in in later life have been further uh, exaggerated uh, by being locked down in our homes, those health inequalities, you know, we've, we've really seen that, yes, age is a very key factor, but it's as much, you know, I know there's this new idea of COVID age, but sort of biological aging. And so those health inequalities do mean that people who are younger in chronological age, but who have, you know, much worse sort of health, um, even if they don't have a diagnosed health condition, are much more susceptible. So, um, I mean, obviously there's more science and I'm not a scientist, but, you know, I think it's just really critical that um, uh, COVID, I think, has, has, has actually heightened the need for action on these issues. Um, you know, it's the first time in a way in history that we've had a pandemic with such an old population and we've just, you know, seen how it, uh, it impacts. Mm. Anything to add on that, David? on the COVID impacts, I mean, you kind of covered it a bit in your updated slides. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, again, I, I, like, I like Anna's optimism and she's right that some of these issues about things like social care are more real. I think the only, the only point I'd make is, look, the government is going to end up with a massive amount of debt and very high spending compared with what they were before. Uh, in the short run, we absolutely should not be in taxes uh, and uh, in the short run, we need to do everything possible to keep the economy going. But in the long run, the, there are constraints on what governments can do because of the amount of spending and borrowing and debt they will have. And that will make the debate on priorities, which is where the real tensions in public policy lie, what gets priority even more acute. The younger generation who've borne the greatest economic hit from the virus, though it's the older generation who've borne the greatest health and medical hit, we don't simply put all the costs of these programs onto younger people. That kind of relates to another question that's come up is about uh, your, in order to pay for this improvement, what the, what both of your views are on uh, a wealth tax of affluent cohorts. Um, is that a good way forward? Or uh, obviously it's been it's a difficult one to implement as it's been seen many times in the past. Um, uh, any thoughts on wealth tax as a way to pay for this improvement? Well, I know David through the Resolution Foundation has done quite a lot of detailed work. So maybe I'll let David go first and then I'll make some more general comments about the wealth and uh, yeah. Uh, okay. okay, well look, um, I think the, in some ways the most profound change in the economic structure of British society in the last 30 years is that wealth has risen relative to GDP. So the amount that we, the total value of our assets, notably housing and pensions, 30 years ago was about three times our annual GDP. They've now increased to about seven times our annual GDP. This is a big change. And even while this has been happening, the amount of tax collected on those assets has not gone up. Now, I don't, I don't mind people being wealthy. I don't hate wealth or want to redistribute just in the interests of egalitarianism. But when you face the question, how do we fund public services, the decent public services we all want, I do think this increase in the value of wealth is a reason why we should be looking at assets as a source of revenue. As a, and I think personally, we should, we, I do it more in sorrow than in anger, but it's got to be done. There was a report the other day of the Treasury looking at capital gains tax. In our report, we talk about how council tax is not fair and equitable. Uh, there are also issues of pensioners not paying national insurance contributions. And that might be a way, given that they, they have a substantial asset in their occupational pension and they have earnings of increasing tax revenues. So my view is, Yes, we do have to look at property as a source of revenues, given the government needs, will in future be facing such a fiscal crisis. So I think, you know, we need to just unpick what the issue is here. So, yes, there was a house price sort of boom, uh, which means that those that were homeowners uh, at the time this happened have been able to, in many ways, add to their housing wealth. So if you were already a homeowner, you're more likely now to have two homes. And um, I think the real sort of issue here is that, yes, you know, 
we do need to find ways of tapping into wealth and potentially as well private pensions, you know, pension income uh, as well. And, uh, you know, I'm sure David uh, would agree would agree with that. And I think we should be looking at that before we're looking at cutting the state pension, you know, because for many people who rely on the state pension, it's already like not very adequate to have any reasonable sort of standard of living. Uh, so I think we've got to start and look at, uh, in a sense, reducing both the wealth and income inequalities at, at later life and not, not to sort of not tax uh, the wealth. But let's be clear, it's about who's got wealth rather than their age. And I think the other thing we've got to be mm. careful of is not seeing the housing wealth as something we can use for multiple things. So it gets talked about to be used to pay for social care. Uh, it's being used to replicate inequalities in housing wealth between generations. So if you, your parents own a property, you're much more likely to become a property owner yourself. And, um, you know, people are getting, they talk about the bank of mum and dad, we should probably be talking about the bank of grandma and grandpa. And um, so I think we're, we're using this money in many ways and see it as sort of a bit of an answer to everything. So I think we just need to be really clear and let's go after the wealth and the income uh, where, where it sits. And yes, you know, housing wealth income is concentrated amongst those who were existing homeowners when, uh, you know, prices went up, particularly in certain parts of the country. And the fix for that is we have to fix the housing market and we have to stop making it so difficult for anybody who isn't a property owner to actually buy a property and we need to improve the security and conditions for everybody who's private renting um, so that it's not the inequality that um, uh, that it is at the moment. Hmm. Great, thank you, thank you Anna. Uh, so just a change of uh, focus a bit too because it's um again a, a lot of good great stuff in the book and obviously for from the center for aging better as well a big focus on uh, aging narratives and how people are seen uh, older groups are seen so there's a question about how important is addressing discrimination and ageism um feature in this decade of aging um better or future of aging better um and are our laws and standards up to scratch to deliver that so I think it's critical that we do certainly challenge uh, ageist attitudes, uh, particularly because if we are so negative about later life, that's about our own future. And we're not going to do anything about our future if we don't have a more realistic and, uh, you know, hopefully more positive or at least optimistic view about what it could be like if we actually change things. So I do think tackling the negative ageist uh, views is, is critical. Um, in terms of you know, age discrimination, yes, age is a, a, equality, a protected characteristic under the Equality Act. Um, I think there are areas um, you know, potentially where there could be more legal challenge around cases of age discrimination, but we need to be clear that people of all ages experience age discrimination. It's not just a, again, it's not about older people um, and it also intersects with other inequalities so older women older women from BAME backgrounds are much more likely to experience disadvantage and discrimination um, than others so um, I think there is a real need for organizations like the Equality and Human Rights Commission to sort of really take a look at age and how it intersects with other protected characteristics and where there is potentially systematic ageism uh, that is um, needing to be addressed. Anything to add to that, David? Well, I, I, I mean, I agree. And in many ways, what I'm trying to do is break down a set of ageist assumptions about income and wealth. Um, the truth is that there are a lot of assumptions, ageist assumptions, that old people are going to be poor and dependent. And I'm challenging that. I'm saying, no, the evidence is increasingly that that's not the case. It's policy that hasn't caught up with that shift. So I agree, we shouldn't, but there's an awful lot of assumptions in public policy where the trigger is reaching a certain age. So we shouldn't be surprised that ageist attitudes survive. Public policy is constructed around a set of assumptions on age. Yeah, 
and 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 misinformed assumptions you know i mean state pension age you know given the huge uh, differences in life expectancy and 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 healthy life expectancy one could argue that you know uh, a state pension age based on chronology uh chronological age you know misses the the fact that people's ability to work uh is it it's very different and the number of years that they will then be entitled to because they won't be alive for as long uh, the very people who need and rely on the state pension will actually draw it for less time. It, but it's very difficult. And I know when John Cridland looked at this, you know, to try and base it on any other factor becomes very dif difficult. But, you know, this is perhaps why radical ideas like a universal basic income start to, you know, be ways of earning out these, um, these age cutoffs and age entitlements. Yeah, just on the, on the interactions between other characteristics that people have. There's quite a few on here that's about uh, Black and Asian minority ethnic status and um, and immigrant, non-immigrant status. And it's just whether you've got um, a vision for the future about how that will, how uh, aging will interact with those other characteristics to, to create different conditions for people in the future, Anna. Have you got uh, from the book and from other analysis? Yeah. So I think this is an area where I would admit uh, that actually if I had the chance to write the book again, uh, I probably would have strengthened the focus on inequality and particularly uh, around racial inequality. The fact is, though, there is very little data and evidence. And the whole point of the Centre for Aging Better is that we base our work on data and evidence. And that's you know, what I've tried to bring together in the book. And you know, most surveys and most data collections do simply not include uh, sufficient uh, BAME data to uh, do robust analysis. So I think the Centre for Aging Better is very clear that we want to work with others to try and address that so that if I rewrote a new edition in uh, maybe hopefully the publishers it'll sell well enough that there might be a second edition in five or ten years like David has uh, done that actually I could write a whole chapter or that it would be woven through that we would actually know much more uh, I mean, the, that's, you know, if we look to the future, this, you know, this cohort that I'm talking about who are approaching later life are hugely more diverse than the uh, generations that have gone before. And so we must uh, start understanding how their experiences and outcomes differ um, and indeed their expectations for later life. But um, yeah. Anything to pick up on that, David? Uh, no, I agree with, I understand. Yeah, there's, a, there's another kind of theme within the questions about how we support uh, people through uh, a more flexible life cycle that they're, they're going through now. So our approaches to lifelong learning and retraining and uh, the more move, the fluid moving in and out of different states of uh, a three stage life, uh, obviously being gone and something much more flexible now. And it's kind of, uh, it'd be good to just get your reflections as a series of different sorts of questions, but your, your reflections on the importance of that as a trend and uh, whether we've got the right responses and support in place for now. So obviously aging is across the life course and I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it sometimes as well in debate that fall into talking about older people when actually this is, is about the whole of society. Um, and certainly the age shift in the population has implications for all of us of whatever age. But, you know, the, the sort of idea that we're living longer and the implications that I set out in the book in terms of public finances will mean that we will have to live, work longer. If we're going to have to work longer, then, you know, to sustain a working life, it's going to be critical to continue to retrain. I mean, that's one of the points I was making about the support that's going to be available to people right now in their 50s and 60s you know yes we obviously need to ensure that um, training is available to get jobs for the younger generation but actually if people in their 50s potentially are going to need to work for another 15 or 20 years they also need access to those sorts of uh, training and retraining opportunities so um, i think it is about you know a lifelong uh, process uh, and I think it also means that some of the comparisons that we make between, you know, what a 70 year old today was doing at 30 mm. uh, are, are no longer valid. People are in education for longer. They're delaying child um, um, settling down um, in terms of having children, uh, delaying perhaps some career sort of uh, decisions, doing more exploring, as, uh, as Andrew Scott and Linda Grattan would, would call it. So. 
and obviously, to, you know, for financial and economic reasons, if they are able to buy a home at all, often that's happening later as well um, in terms of, of home ownership. So there's a lot of changes which you can look at and say that's all about lower living standards. But you can look at some of those trends and say, actually, that looks like a good response to a hundred year life to sort of, um, you know, stretch things out a bit. Um, don't leave all the extra time at the end, you know, take some of the extra time as you're, as you're going along. So, um, you, you know, I would, I would agree that there are um, certainly uh, quite significant implications for work, working lives, careers and education. David, anything to add? Yes, I I would make one comment, which, which picks up with several of the, the issues in the Q&A. Um, there is a group, I'm very aware, there's a group in the mid-50s to mid-60s, often who've been doing physical work, who may well be suffering ill health, and who, are, and who do get a raw deal. Actually, one of the reasons why they get the raw deal is that because the value of working age benefits is so much lower now than the value of pension benefits that they're basically hanging on, hanging on, on very low incomes until they start getting their pension. So there is that group, and I'm very aware of them. There, are, there is, however, a completely different group, which is people rather than are older, but who are still... Uh, fortunately in good health, who want to carry on working and for whom the impediments to their working have been removed. The compulsory retirement age is gone. Uh, they certainly don't even pay national insurance on their earnings if they're working about pension age. And that is why, as the circumstances become more different, that is why I do think things like means testing of benefits, like the BBC, poor old BBC's proposal on the, the, the free TV licence makes sense and I was very disappointed with the idea that it should be means tested. I do think, if one buys the argument there is this diversity amongst older people, it, it means those types of criteria are better rather than simply having an age test. And I wouldn't disagree. Because <laughs> <laughs> as I'm really arguing, and I hope it comes through in the book, you know, because there are income inequalities in every generation, that using age as a proxy, whether that's as a proxy for health or as a proxy for ability to work or as a proxy for wealth or income in that case, you know, that that, that does come from the era that you talk about in the past where age was a good proxy for poverty and it isn't the case any longer. Great. Um, so I think we're, we're coming, drawing towards uh, the end here. I mean, I think it'd be good to get um, some any final reflections from David on on the discussion and then end with you Anna on there's a couple of questions that relate to that about you know what's your having written the book now what's the the, the biggest surprise that you you got from going through all the data and and seeing all the trends or what's the one policy solution that you think we should do I mean I think there's there's lots of great comments in there too about this is a long-term issue where there's not going to be one simple thing and so what are the collection of uh, important things that we could we could do. Uh, it's going to be a lot of uh, changes that interact and reinforce each other. So it'd be good to just get your reflection. But first, State David, um, any further thoughts before we have to unfortunately wrap up? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I would, I think we haven't touched on what I think is the most uh, potentially highly charged bit in, in Anna's book, which is healthcare costs. Because I do think when you have a growing population of older people it pushes up healthcare costs and that pushes up public spending and that then has to be financed somehow um, and Anna has a very interesting discussion of the last year of life and how that's really where the healthcare costs are racking up and kind of implies that we could design the last year of life better in such a way that it doesn't cost so much um, and I think that's incredibly delicate territory but if there's any person who can walk across that minefield without being having the bombs explode underneath her it's Anna <laughs> so I do think that is a very interesting issue because ultimately we're talking about how you allocate limited resources and as we emerge from this virus resources are going to be even more limited that's why we do have to confront painful issues about who gets priority and who is and where the poorest people are to be found. Great Thank you, Anna. Well, thank, thank you very much, David, for raising uh, the, 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 the big issue that we haven't touched on that's probably the most controversial. So I'll leave that as attempting the audience to <laughs> yeah. actually go and buy the book so they can read what I have to say. Uh, but I do think as confronting our fear of death, 
uh, as a society is a very fundamental to having an adult conversation about the intensity of treatment and care that we are providing people at the end of life. Um, obviously, it's a very charged debate, as we've seen through the COVID, with uh, you know GPs issuing do not resuscitate letters on the basis of age. Um, so again, uh, you know these require uh, conversations between uh, health professionals and and individuals and families, but they have to happen much earlier. And um, so I think there is a real sort of you know uh, argument from me in the book that we actually need to sort of start talking about the taboo of death and, and end of life and what a good death um, actually mm. looks like. Mm. Um, so in terms of, you asked me, Bobby, about the surprises. I guess because I've worked with the team at Aging Better the last five years and most of this draws on their work, um, there weren't, weren't too many surprises for me, but maybe that's to ask the readers. I hope there's lots of surprises for you, interesting facts, things that will make you think differently. And, you know, absolutely, there, you know, if, if anybody asks me, so what, which, which one thing uh, would you pick? And the reason that the manifesto at the end is not a list of specific policy proposals, of which there are many through the book, um, but is rather about a call to action from national government to have a uh, ageing and cross-sectoral strategy to local government leaders, to businesses, is because this is such a fundamental issue for our society and it will need, if we are going to have this age of ageing better uh, and you know, rise to the challenge in a way of the age shift, then it's going to need concerted action from all of us. And you know, for those who are listening, if you're an employer, if you're involved in the housing sector or community, um, there are things in here that you can do and play your part. So uh, I will avoid the question and not pick one. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you so much, Anna. Um, uh, I just, um, uh, before I do the final thank yous, can we see if we can put the poll back up just quickly, see if we have changed people's minds since we're still on four o'clock exactly. Uh, have we got... I'm going to fill up my glass to make sure I'm... Uh... Okay, so a quick check before, a quick uh, temperature read of the audience. I'm going to vote this time. Um, if I'm, I think I'm allowed to vote. Uh, We've still got 200 odd people, so let's see what we get. Let's see if we've shifted views from people that have mostly been working in this area for the whole of their lives. I doubt the last 55 minutes will have utterly turned you around, but <laughs> let's have a, a look. Can we see the results, Rebecca, if you've got them? Oh, oh, we sort of <laughs> slightly, slightly more pessimistic. We've outlined the challenges. But still, on balance, uh, optimistic uh, for the future. But it shows that uh, we're on we're on an important issue. I suppose is the key thing. So, uh, I wish we had more time. Wish I could have got through more of your questions. I had over fifty there to try to get through and, and bring together. Um, I hope we can get together to do events uh, in person and have more of a chat afterwards at some point soon. So, just finally, from me, I need to thank uh, the team at Kings, uh, the Policy Institute, for organising this for Aging Research at Kings. Uh, for their support for the event to thank you for coming uh, and of course to our speakers um, thank you very much to both speakers Anna and David the video will be available on the YouTube channel uh, and finally of course the main point of all of this uh, do buy Anna's book uh, it's great thank you thanks